Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. It's facts, I'm the best, you know what I mean? I sometimes, I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Episode 61. Once again, here in studio, the Last Round Podcast. Coming off of a DAZN card on Friday. Do we have anything on Saturday, Mike? This Saturday? This past Saturday. Did we have there, there was a couple of fights. There was, right? <laughs> I don't know. But once again, guys, thank you for listening. Jump it on. Uh, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Audio Boom, Spotify, whatever. We appreciate it. Once again, I'm Danny Z with my co-host, Michael Shepard. Shepard. Anybody? Anybody get that David reference? David Diamante. David Diamante. <laughs> <laughs> I've been preparing that for days now. Mike For weeks, this. practicing at home in front weeks, of the mirror. Weeks, weeks. You know who David Diamante is, Luis? And, you know, he's not on the mic right now, but we do have a guest in studio, Luis Mejia, uh, one of the, the pro photographers in the game. So he just shot Luis, uh, not Luis Santa Cruz, Leo Santa Cruz's fight at the MGM Grand Garden Casino. I'm sure you guys have seen his photos because they're all over the place, but he's right here chilling with us. Um, but we are big fans of uh, David Diamante, right? How he announces. Diamante. Diamante. <laughs> We've been saying that for weeks, and then my Mike was like, say it on air, man. <laughs> say it on air. So I'm going to try to remember every single week. But, you know, jumping right into it, it's just me and you today, Mike. We've had, what, how many guests in a row in the last several weeks, Ooh. and now it's just me and you? Weeks and weeks and weeks. So, hey, it's all right. That's how we started this show, right? So we can do it. We can do it. I'm not afraid. Uh, going back to this past Friday. Friday the 13th. Did you know it was Friday the 13th? I'm lucky for some. Shit. Man. I mean, it wasn't unlucky for Virgil Ortiz that night. He did well. So he gets the win uh, in, a, in the card he was headlining on the zone from the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California. Ortiz improves to 15-0 and with 15 knockouts. All 15 wins, all 15 of his pro wins, he stopped the person or knocked them out, TKO, whatever. Uh, in the fifth round, he takes care of Brad Solomon, who suffers the second defeat of his career. Um, and then it was for one of your favorite belts, the WBA gold welterweight title. That's it. That, that belt's what, maybe six months old? Yeah, I think it kind of came around for him. And then obviously, Ronnie Rios picked one up as well, the WBA gold. <laughs> the WBA gold? What does that mean? Like, what? what <laughs> tell me what it means. Tell me it's right now. Just one, you got the super. And then the normal WBA, and then I think this is the one below that. The normal one is the regular champion, right? Mm -hmm. Oh man! And now there's a gold status. It's just like I, I hope, I hope, I hope fighters start saying like you know, like when instead of saying like oh I want to be world champ, no, I I want to be the gold champ. That's what I want to go for. And they just like completely sidestep the world title classification. Is it Oprah Winfrey is one for you, one for you, <laughs> one for you. Give them all belts, belts for all. Belts for all. But. Mike was actually there ringside uh, at the Fantasy Springs Casino. And, you know, since you were there ringside, Mike, I'll let you uh, take care of the analysis first. What did you think of Ortiz? I thought he was good. You know, like we kind of started at the start of this year. He was kind of one of the prospects uh, we were picking for to have a good year. A uh, good crowd for him. I was kind of surprised. I wasn't too sure how full it was going to be with him, you know, being from Texas, even though he's a what golden you, boy fighter. What do you estimate? How many people? I thought it used to be around 2,000, less than a Cancio fight. There was a few That's uh, actually empty pretty spaces. Good. That's pretty but good. But for a Friday, I would have said around 2,000. I think the first 150 people through the door got a free Virgil Ortiz t-shirt. That's pretty sweet. So, you know, that brings people in. A uh, good performance from him, really just went in there and blew away Brad Solomon. Uh, I think he was another person who hadn't, hadn't been stopped before because he's obviously on this, this record of this year. You've got uh, Anthony Orozco, uh, Mauricio Herrera. Antonio, All guys. Antonio Orozco. Antonio Orozco, sorry. Mauricio Herrera. None of these guys had been stopped. But Virgil Ortiz just goes in there, seems to have everything. Good chin, good variation of punches, good and he's footwork. Only, and he's only 21. And he's only 21. He's only 21. It's only going to get better. I think if we touched on this with the Mikey Garcia interview we did on Friday, it's, 
The only thing I think he needs a little bit more is a little bit more promotion. He's one of those guys that just goes in there and really makes his work, do the talking for him. You know, he's not a Ryan Garcia that's prominent on Instagram or Twitter and sells himself that way, or like a Tyson Fury that's just, you know, big, loud, boisterous, you know, when he steps into the room. Sergio Ortiz is a little bit quieter, but look at the performances he's been putting in. No, you're right. You're right. And like you mentioned right now, you touched on Mikey Garcia, who was at the fight. That's his stable mate. Virgil Ortiz is actually trained by Robert Garcia, Mikey Garcia's brother. So they train at it right there, the Robert, Robert Garcia Boxing Academy in Riverside, California. Um, and like you touched on, Mikey was there, and you were able to have him on uh, a bonus show right there from the Fantasy Springs Casino. Um, and then also the uh, Ring TV's uh, Cynthia Conte was also nice enough to help us out. Um, so we appreciate them for jumping on that past Friday. And then you asked Mikey about, you know, what he thought about Virgil Ortiz's performance. And like you just mentioned what you just mentioned about how Virgil Ortiz obviously has the talent, but he might not have the promotional backing. Like, you know, he's obviously a quiet guy. You know, he lets his, his fist do the talking. Um, and you asked Mikey that, right? You asked Mikey that, like, you know, what his opinion is on, on Virgil's, I guess, you know, the way he handles media as compared to like Ryan Garcia and stuff like that. And what, what did he tell you? He, what was he, his opinion? His opinion was that it's just not really in Virgil's personality. And he kind of touched on, you know, he really just lets, you know, his body of work in the ring do the talking for him. And so far, obviously, he's done very well. You know, 15 appearances, 15 KOs. You know, looking at that on paper, that's somebody you'd w really want to tune in and watch. Legit. No, the kid's good, man. Mm -hmm. The kid's good, and he's very, like, He's got great boxing ability. Like, if you actually watch him, like, obviously he's fan-friendly because he gets the knockouts, which is great. Because that's how you attract, like, I mean, you know, fighters know this. Like, whether they say, like, oh, you know, like, you know, going back to, like, the Ruiz-Anthony Joshua fight, how Joshua, out, you know, pretty much outboxed him. But it was people, the hype was so high, people wanted, like, another knockout and stuff. Like, I feel like Ortiz can, yeah, he's knocking everybody out that he's facing, which is, you know, good for his, his you know his status and everything but i think that even if he had to like he had to box you i feel like he could easily do that too just like by the way you you know you study him and watch him in his fights he has very good technique i think robert garcia and and the team over there are, have been doing a great job with the guy and he's only 21 so like 15 to no 15 ko's who i okay if you're promoted if you're golden boy right now or robert garcia and you have a chance to mention an, a name next who who would it be like if you can hypothetically pick it i would be looking at someone maybe not a title holder as such but maybe a keith thurman someone with a maybe Thur a thurman really like in, in the in the 16th fight really he, that's a pretty big step up regardless if thurman is not the same fighter he was like three years ago i think that's a name that came out of virgil ortiz's mouth though right this year after the orozco fight Oh, that's right. I think he did touch on... Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm going to go with what he said. I think he must have said that for a reason. Maybe he's seen a few things in you know, Thurman's performances. Maybe the injuries he's had over the years. That Thurman's a big name that would propel Virgil, I would say, very highly into the top five in that division. But I don't... See, but I don't... I still think Thurman... I still think Thurman's too... I'm not saying that Virgil Ortiz can't eventually get to that level and be competitive with Thurman, but I just think Thurman... It still might be a little bit too much of a step up for Ortiz at this moment. That's Putin. He has the full WBA title. Yeah, I could see that. I see. That. I mean, I, you know, where you asked Mikey Garcia about, like, obviously he did over the weekend. He announced that he signed with the Zone and he signed with Eddie Hearn's Matchroom Boxing. Um, and you had asked him on Friday, which, by the way, you know, if uh, if Mikey's listening to this or any, you know, he already had signed when you asked him that. We know. <laughs> we know that. We know that. So when you asked him on Friday night, like, hey, you know what's going on with the status? You know, like, you know, there's rumors about this. You and Jesse Vargas, who Jesse Vargas has been fighting on the zone. So, um, you know, he he obviously said, oh, you know, we're not anywhere right now. That's why I'm a free agent and stuff. He, his contract, like, he already had signed that contract way before. But that's why when it came out, like we talked about just before it came on air, when Eddie Hearn tweeted out the following day this past Saturday, oh, 24 hours, big news. And then the next day, they announced Mikey as a signing. Uh, like, he could have told us. Imagine if he would have dropped think, that news. I think Eddie listened to the show Friday. Yeah, he knew Heard it. Mikey was a free agent. And because yeah. of the last because round Because of podcast, the last round. He picked him up. Picked him up. So you're welcome. You're welcome, Matchroom. You're welcome for that. But, I mean, you know, 
going back to to my original point is how you asked him about Jesse Vargas. Uh, that that was a, a name we've been hearing. Um, I could see I, going back to Ortiz. I could I I would like like a Jesse Vargas matchup for Virgil Ortiz at one forty seven. <laughs> Jesse Vargas won't want any part. <laughs> no, but like I feel like that's a, like I feel like Jesse's a good test for him because I mean like I mean if you if I mean, if you want to be honest like from a boxing standpoint like you know Jesse Vargas isn't in the level right now of like uh, like obviously a Pacquiao or like a Sean Porter and those guys, but he's still a good boxer and he can give you a a, a good fight. And I think for Ortiz, that would be a good matchup for him. You know what I mean? I think it would be a good matchup for him. And they're both tall. They're both tall guys. Yeah, they're both tall for, for, for the weight. Uh, obviously, Jesse Vargas has the resume. You know, he'd be a name, another name to stick on Ortiz's I think that's list. A, I think that's a great matchup for I, I think so. I think Ortiz would be too heavy-handed. I think he's got a good boxing IQ. And he's for his age, he comes across very grown-up, very experienced. Doesn't rush his work, takes his time. You know, I think... Him and Jesse Vargas is, would be makeable, both on the zone. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think I, I could see it. Yeah. I could see it, but I mean, would Vargas want that fight? No, I think for Vargas, it's kind of a step down. Vargas is looking more for you know names and paydays. No, absolutely. Yeah, so, I don't think Jesse would take it unless the money was right. Yeah, no, I I understand that. I understand that, but I mean, I think Ortiz having 15 wins, 15 KOs now. I think by his 20th win, or even five fights. I think, and that and that's just me. Per- kind of being conservative. Um, I think by his 20th win, he's going to have, a, he's already going to be at least get a world title shot. And, and I think he, maybe even sooner, maybe within three fights. The only, I think the only trouble he has is just the division he's in is stacked. Lots of I mean, good fighters. So pa- Pacquiao has a title. I think he relinquished it, didn't he? And Best Putin picked that up or did he get the super? I don't even know. I think, I, I think Pacquiao relinquished so, it and Best Putin picked up the WBA. So Spence has two. He has the IBF and the WBC. Mm-hmm. Pacquiao has a WBA. Uh, I think Best Putin has a WBA. Well, I mean, well, it's it's well, both say, we'll, we'll, we'll say whatever, both. Yeah. whatever, regular super. Let's mm-hmm. just say Pacquiao has it. Uh, and who has a W? Well, Crawford, Crawford. Yeah. So I mean, all the belts are essentially with PBC right now, and then top rank. And Ortiz is over here on the zone, Golden Boy. Wrong side of the street. Wrong side of the street. Wrong side of the street. So, I mean, I don't know. I I, I mean, like, I, I, you know how impressive it would be if, like, you know, if Goldemo was just like, look, Ortiz, like, we're going to let you go. Or DAZN just lets him, like, like they did with Ramirez Hooker. They let mm-hmm. Ramirez go to DAZN, and he beat Hooker, and now he has the belts on ESPN. I I would have faith enough faith in Ortiz, like, yeah, send him over there. like To which one? It doesn't matter as long as he can get a title shot. You know, I mean, like, well, well, out of those, they, they, who, who's his best chance? Out of those, oh, I don't know. That's Putin. That's a hard. Oh well, yeah, if it, ideally, yeah, ideally. But I mean, like, even if Pacquiao has a, has the titles or Spence or Crawford, all those are hard fights regardless. And I think he loses all of those. Did you see the interview with Bob Aaron where he said that he heard that Errol, from a good source, Errol Spence? You know what I won. saw? I saw that, but like. We all know how promoters, especially Bob Arum, because he's been in the, the game the longest. Yeah. And Bob Arum is very good about, like, you know, what's that infamous quote? He said, like, yesterday I was lying, today I'm telling the truth, or, yeah. or vice versa. Like, but, I mean, he could be right. Do you want to, it, just, it, want to say what he said? It, what? Because we didn't finish what he, what he actually said. Oh, yeah, go ahead. He finished, that Bob Arum said in an interview with IFL TV that he'd heard from a good, reliable source that Errol Spence was, is just a lot more injured than then it's been let on or he won't be coming back. It was something along those lines, right? Well, the reason, the reason why, like initially when, when, when promoters say stuff, you know, you want to take it with a grain of salt, especially when they're, when they're talking about stuff, um, because obviously they want to, you know, promote their fighters. So when Bob Barham said that, and I saw that I was, at first I was like, ah, you know, but then I thought about it. I was like, well, I mean, you haven't really heard anything from Spence and he's kind of been staying low. He's been laying low. Um, and even like you know PBC, like they haven't really mentioned him. They haven't really touched him. They're like, oh yeah, he's coming back. They, it feels like they've been trying to like make you ignore it. I mean, it was a bad crash, you know. Like it was a really bad crash. It could have been way worse. Like he could have died. That like, could have been really bad. Um, and 
So it, it it just based on that whole situation, that whole you know, in, you know optics of it. What Bob Arum is saying, it could be right. It could be right. But maybe Spence isn't gonna ever be the same, or or maybe who knows? We don't know that. We haven't heard anything. You know, I mean, he was they they had planned what the Danny Garcia fight in January supposedly. Yeah, and he's fighting what Red Catch now. Yeah, so like that's not gonna happen. Um, but even then though, like, I never thought like, even if Spence, even when he beat, or when he fought Porter and he beat Porter and they announced like Danny Garcia in the ring, they're like, oh, in January, in January, I still didn't think that was going to happen in January. I was like, they're saying it, but that, I don't think it's going to happen, you know, like, but I mean, it sounds, but do you, do you believe it? Like, do you think Spence, I, I could, I could believe it. He's injured and won't come back or is it's just worse? Well, that, that it's worse that they're let, that they're letting on to believe. You know, uh, I kind of believe Bob Arum. I think it's you know, be kind of a mean thing to you know insinuate that someone is you know worse than they are. And I know he likes to play games, but I would hope not about someone's health. I mean, maybe. I mean, who knows? Like, let's let's just see, let's just see what pops up. But I mean, like, he's been posting, uh, you know, he's been posting stuff on online. He just said something about Tim Bradley. Some racist, oh, right. I saw that. Yeah. Some racist comment, yeah, you know, like because after Bradley's little tirade on ESPN, yeah. that, you know, we'll, we'll touch on right now. But you know, going back to uh, Vir- Virgil Ortiz, I like the kid. Um, I think at 21 years old, like he's, you know, he's got he's like a Canelo, he's like a Canelo for Golden Boy because I mean, like when Canelo was at that age, I think he already he had his first world title at I think about the same age. Uh, similarly, yeah, he was young. Yeah, about the same age as Virgil Ortiz is right now. So I think Golden Boy and De La Hoya and Derek Gomez, Robert Diaz, I think they see that like, hey, you know, this he's he's in that same path. Like he could fight, you know, he's got the talent. So I could see it that within three fights he has a world title shot. I would like to see Golden Boy give them some, you know, care and attention and, you know, breed him through, you know, match him well, because to me he has Thousands of times more potential than a Ryan Garcia. But Ryan Garcia gets the money thrown at him. He gets the red carpet. You know, Oscar De La Hoya looks after him, goes, goes to his fights. But isn't that all, always how it, how it is, though, in, 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 you know, in boxing or even in MMA? Like, the moneymaker is... I think he will be. Bro, look at Broner. He will be a moneymaker, though. No, you're right. But, like, but look, at, look at somebody like Broner. You know, four weight world champion, but like, look at the names he actually beat. Like, that's what he get. That's what he gets criticized for. But, but because of his personality, people tune in to watch him. He moves the needle. So that you know, that's why. That's why he got a Pacquiao fight. If 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 Broner didn't have that personality, he wouldn't have got that Pacquiao fight. But they knew that he would. He was going to help the card. He was going to help the ratings. He was going to help the pay per view buy. So, Garcia is pretty much the same thing. Like. You know, hope, you you want to you want to hope like even this this fight the Romero Duno fight. You know, now that we're kind of going off on a tangent, like <laughs> it doesn't really yeah, it didn't really show if he's improved or not. But you know, but we all everybody you know any decent boxing fan knows that Ortiz is the overall the more talented fighter. That you know, I mean, would you say arguably that Ortiz is the second best talent overall that Golden Boy has behind Canelo? Overall, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, he's the b- the biggest potential talent they have, and then probably second best overall. Yeah, I would agree yeah. with that. The Na- Linares is on the way down. I would say he's definitely more talented than Ryan Garcia. So, yeah, but I like Ortiz, man. He has a high ceiling, so we'll we'll see where he goes. And then we're moving on to this past Saturday, the fourteenth of December, from I'm not going to call it the Mecca of boxing because we're over in the West Coast. The Mecca of boxing is a StubHub Center, right, Mike? <laughs> That's true. Um, from MSG, Madison Square Garden in New York City on ESPN. This was actually a very entertaining fight. It was. It's a uh, good card. All these people, and then I wouldn't say all these people because we're included too. You know, everybody, I think we all had an assumption that Mean Machine Kavalowskis wasn't going to give him the fight because he wasn't really known and everybody wants to see Crawford fight the PBC welterweights and stuff like that. Um, there was It was an entertaining fight. And then uh, I forgot who tweeted it. Somebody tweeted it, and I think it was a media member, but they said that Crawford has the nastiest mean streak of a fighter than any f- other any fighter right now. And I agree with that. 
His mean streak is ridiculous. I, because I think what round was it where I think he was he started getting the best of of Mean Machine and then like you can just see his face like he's just pissed off. Do you remember what round round, round that was? I think he, I think he got clipped in the third. Was it the second or third round where he kind of were? It, I'm pretty sure it was a knockdown. It looked like it, a knockdown it, to it, me. It, I think I think it was a knockdown. I think it was a knockdown. When I saw it, I was like, oh, he knocked him down. What the fuck? But Crawford was kind of clever because he kind of stumbled and then he kind of looked like he grabbed think, hold of his hips. No, I think he he knew that. He knew he was going down like yeah, his so legs. Yeah, he grabbed the hold of him. So he grabbed the hold of him. He's like, okay, I'm going to make it seem like I'm... Yeah. So and then I, I think because he kind of moved his body to try and get Crawford off him, it looked maybe from where the referee stood, looked like he kind of threw him. Yeah. So he was kind of like, oh, no, 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 it's not a knockdown. But that he, was a he, knockdown. He threw him. That was a knockdown. And yeah, then, I think yeah. they even said on commentary, you know, that it was a knockdown. But I think that all no, Andre, of that, Andre Ward didn't say that. He's like, "Oh, that didn't look like a knockdown to me." I don't know if well, he. Cha- I don't. Yeah. I don't know if he changed his opinion later. I'm but, not a fan of those two. But Brett, you could. Like, they Watson don't. They don't hide their biases at all. No. At no. all. Him and Tim Brad- But you know why though? I think ESPN loves Tim Bradley. Now we're going off on this tangent. <laughs> they love Tim Bradley because he's like a Teddy Atlas. He's just crazy. You bring back Teddy Atlas. I find Tim Bradley and Andre Ward annoying. <laughs> that's that's a different show. <laughs> If you could, if you could see Mike's face right now, he's just so <laughs> disappointed. I, I am. They, they wind me up. That's what we need to get on YouTube so you guys can see his reactions. I've got a face for radio, so I think he's we're got good. a face for radio. <laughs> but you know, I think that that the 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 hype obviously behind this fight was like obviously lower than any other welterweight fight, at least between like the PBC fighters, obviously. But Kavalowski came to fight, you know. And then, you know, and then this is kind of going back to how people talk about pound for pound for Crawford and stuff like that, which is, you know, I understand. I recognize that he has talent. He's obviously, he's special. You can see it. Uh, you can see it because even when the guys start brawling with him and he's in trouble, he comes back and he just beats, he, he, he beats you to your own game. I mean, we could see that. What did you think of him coming out in Southpaw and then sticking with it? Well, he's been, he's been doing, he, that's not surprising. I, I wasn't surprised But he wasn't that. working. It was not. And then about the sixth round, when he started to get on top, he changed to orthodox and then just took over and got, got him out of there. What, I think, what fight, what fight was it where, who did he fight last? Amir Khan. Was it Khan? I, Before I that was Benavides. Was it Benavides? I think he tried that with Benavides and Benavides was catching him. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Like, I think Crawford, like, you know, he's a, he can obviously do it. He can switch stances. But obviously one... You know his natural. I think what's his. He's a orthodox, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's his more his more powerful side. And I mean, do you think he 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 does the the southpaw stance more because like people expect it out of him now? Like because obviously he gets clipped. I think the southpaw stance maybe because most boxers are orthodox and a lot of boxers don't like facing. No, southpaws. yeah, and I understand that, but he get, he does get tagged when he switches. No, yeah, he do, he does get tagged. I like think it's, maybe it's not it's not like like Max Kellerman like. Kisses his ass all the time. Like, he's the best switch hitter I've ever seen. It's just like, well, I mean, like, I get because, like, th- there's not that many people to compete over the boxing history who are, like, switch hitters like that, you know? Not that have power in both hands like he does. No, you're right. Yeah. You're right. And, I, and I, you know, I'm not saying that he's not good on both sides, but, like, I mean, he gets clipped when he switches. He does. He gets hit more. So, yeah. you know, and that's what Cavalazzi was doing when he switched. He started tagging him. So, I mean, I don't know. I thought, I thought, it, I thought it was a great fight. I thought... I thought Kavalowskis, you know, gained respect. Um, and then, but he just, he just, uh, he, he turned on the mean streak from Crawford and then Crawford just ended up beat him to the punch, especially with that uppercut towards the, towards the end of the fight. That was a nasty uppercut from Crawford. I thought, I thought the finish was excellent. I thought where he had him against the ropes, he realized he was too close, changed his feet, took a little step out, created the space and the shape for the uppercut, boom, put the uppercut in there. Yeah. But like you say, I thought Kavlaskis did well. He came in there, probably won respect, won over probably some more fans who didn't know who he was. Nobody's going to want to fight him, though. No, exactly. No one's going to want to fight him. And I think, you know, Crawford gets another W, but where does he go now? That's the problem. The same thing yeah. he's had for months. Who, I mean, realistically, who, you know, who who does he get? Luis Calazo. Do you really think, it, you really think <laughs> it's that route, honestly? I Unless the BBC, well, the name that everyone keeps I, saying uh, is Sean Park. Sean Potter yeah, seems but, to be the one. Yeah, but like I just I just don't see the I don't see PBC giving him anything. Nothing. I, I don't see it. I well, don't they see keep it. saying that PBC will allow if Crawford, Sean Potter because no one looks good against Potter. 
No, you're right. You're right. I think I, I think we've touched on this before. I think Porter gives the most rugged and toughest fight to all the world, all the top welterweights in the division. We saw that because he's hard to look good against. Like we saw at, that with Errol Spence. Yeah, look at when he fought Errol Spence, when he fought Keith Thurman, when he fought Danny Garcia. They all fought, fought him kind of similarly because it's hard to fight the guy, you know. And it, it's all kind of similar in how they fight him and how he fights them. He's just on top of you. So I could see PB like. If it's anybody, they're gonna let Sean Porter fight him, because Sean Porter, like even like even the, the the fights that he lost when he lost to to Spence and when he lost to Thurman, it's not like he got blown out. You know, they were arguable losses. You know, arguable wins and stuff like that. So I mean, I don't know. I I do you think they would let? Do you think they would let Porter come to ESPN to fight him? I would say so. You know, because it's it's like. You know, the top rank and hooker. You know, when you send him over there, they send Sean Porter to fight Crawford, hoping that he comes back with a belt. No, you're right. Porter's going over there with nothing, gets a payday, mm -hmm. and then he's got the chance to win a belt, bring another belt, bring the whole set, pretty much, yeah, back to PBC. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, yeah, I guess they don't have anything to lose because Porter doesn't have a belt that he's taking over there. And if he beats Crawford, he brings the belt back to PBC and Fox. Risk and reward. Yeah, I could see that, but I just don't. I just don't see PBC and Al Heyman giving him the time of day right now. Like they're gonna try to shut him out, especially because they know his back is definitely against the wall. It's been against the wall the last couple fights. I mean, it's pretty much been against the wall since he got to the welterweight division. You know, outside we, of the PBC, we, you've got what? We, man. Best Putin is in the I same could, stable. Honestly, I could see, I could see like top rank even mention, like even debating to put Virgil Ortiz in there. You know, like, hey, do you want him, do you want him to get a shot against Crawford? Just because they need something. But I, but I can see Golden Boy is like, no, not yet. Like, give us a couple fights and you know we'll do it. I could see that. Do you think with that performance, do you think his stock dropped? Or Ramirez moves up, he vacates. Who's Crawford's? Does yeah. his stock drop? Because of the performance, because it took no. him a few rounds to get going, he took a lot of shots. No, I don't think so. I don't think his stock dropped at all. I think it's about the same. Like he's, I'm. Look, at, I'm, we. I think we've had this discussion when you know everybody has this discussion right now, especially with Crawford, in terms of the whole pound for pound ranking. Like people rate him high because they can. He passes the eye test, which he undoubtedly does. Everybody can see that he's talented, but he just doesn't have the resume. He fought Horn to get that title. I mean Horn. Shouldn't have beat Pacquiao, you know. He he was a belt holder. You know, we've touched on that. Like, there's a difference between the designation of being a world champion and being a world title holder. You know, like there's a difference. There's a difference, and people can like get mad at that all they want, but you know, it, it's it's that's when the politics, the promotional politics, and the sanctioning body politics come into play. It's like, oh yeah, you navigate how to get there. You know, um, but I mean. I don't know. He, he if he goes like a Luis Calazo after this, like Kel Brook, a best Putin, and he's just running out of options and ideas. And you know, Crawford's not young. No, he's not. He's thirty three, I think. So thirty three. You know, looking at that, he needs to really I mean, go into top rank, sit down with Bob Arum, and just tell him, "Hey, I need these fights to legitimize my resume." But then in the interview with Andre Ward. He kind of said, he you know, that he's happy with it. He, he didn't, thinks, yeah, he didn't call out anybody, like no. in the in the post fight in the ring or the the Andre Ward interview. Like he said, he's good in the Hall of Fame with his resume now. No, so he said, no, no, not at all, not at all. Oh, and then what? What? Speaking of that, who do um, you sent me? Uh, Mike sent me an article this, earlier today. He was pretty upset about um, saying that uh, Demetrius Andrade is. Uh, it has his building a Hall of Fame worthy co career or something like that. Yahoo Sports, Kevin Ioli. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say his name, Jeez. but you. you <laughs> I know that these. I know that Green's legal in Vegas, but to be writing stories like that, he was on some strong stuff. You I never know, you man. Now. You never know, but you know, I just wanted to touch on it since you mentioned Hall of Fame. But I mean, I I I think if Crawford, I don't know, like when they interviewed him in the ring, like Bernardo Osuna was trying to get him to call like cuz I think ESPN knows like hey he need he needs to fight these guys you know they know it they know it like they're like he's you know and they obviously have confidence in the guy top rank and ESPN have confidence in his abilities and I think Bernardo Cena was trying to get him to like 
say something. And Crawford would not say anything. I'm just like, come on, man. Like, like he, you know, he, he's good. He's a great fighter. He knows he's good. Like, I mean, does he not, is it top rank coaching him, telling him not to say it? Or is it Crawford saying like, ah, you know, I don't need it. Like, you know, like. I don't think it's, it's, it's a hid, hidden that Crawford's not the best interview. He's not. And he's I th- not the best interview. And I think that he believes in himself so much that he doesn't need to go around doing theatrics to get fights. You know, in the interview of Andre Ward, like we just said, he touched on, he believes he already has a Hall of Fame career. He doesn't believe there's such a thing as the wrong side of the street. Right. So I think but he there is, maybe though. believes, and I agree with you, but I think he maybe believes that the fights are going to be made. But like me and you've touched on in the podcast earlier, to me, I think they need to make the theatrics. They need to call each other out. They need to get it to the point where Top Rank and PBC can't hold the fight back mm-hmm. to the point where the fans are just screaming for it. They can stick it on a pay-per-view. Everybody gets paid. Everybody's happy. Let me, gets made. let me ask you this. You mentioned that Porter is the ideal PBC welterweight right now who might face Crawford. If anybody, it might be him first. Mm-hmm. And the PBC might be okay with it. Who, in terms of not- notoriety or being noticed, popularity, I guess, A-side? And I'm not talking about champion. I'm talking about, like, you know, being known. Who's more known, Crawford or Porter? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? Crawford, I mean, Porter's fought Thurman. He's fought Spence. He just fought Spence. Like, oh, That's a good one. That's a good one. That's... Crawford is, is getting there because he's on ESPN. And right, that's a big, big platform. No, it is. Yeah, and yeah, you know, Sean Paul is on Fox, and he's and he's been in mega. He's been in prominent fights the last couple of years. Yeah, he's been in some, and he's obviously an ex world champion. And he lives in, obviously trains out of Vegas. Right, that's a good one. Maybe part of by a smidgen, just because he's media one. friendly. I, I don't even know who to choose in that. I don't. I don't I just because he's media friendly. Yeah. Are you, this, this is for if they fought, he would be the A side and B side. Is that where the question? Yeah, because obviously both of their. I honestly think like ESPN and Top Rank, which I can understand because you know they would go into that fight trying to be the A side. Like, oh, he's got the title, and I think that would be the the tipping point for them is like saying like, look, like they might have similar statuses in the boxing game, but Crawford's a champion, so at least tip it to us. Maybe like a 60-40, 52-48 or something like that. You know, I think Sean Paul would go with that though. Yeah. I think he seems like he's, he's, he's a switched on, likable, media friendly guy. And I don't see him putting things in the way to satisfy his own ego for a chance at a world title. Like imagine if Crawford called them, called them out on ESPN and was just like, like, yeah, he's like, I'll go to Fox. He's like, I'll go to Fox and take your titles. And imagine if they, if, they, if, if Heyman was like, oh yeah. He's coming over here. Cool. We'll get all the. We'll get most of the money then, and and Crawford like obviously he has talent and he goes over there and he wins. I I honestly think he should have did that, because Crawford obviously like I mean that to a lot of people he's probably is the best welterweight. Him and Spence, you know. I I don't know. He he need he needs something though. There's nobody else out there. To, that, I mean, Kavalowskis. Even though he gave him a good fight, he did knock him down. Even though they didn't count it, it's going to be like a Floyd Mayweather Zab Judah thing. Somebody mentioned that online, and I saw people getting mad, like in, in the convers- in the comments or something. I thought it was kind of funny, but but Kavalowskis, Amir Khan, David Benavides, Jeff Horn, who else? Is that it? Four fights to welterweight. That's his last four, right? I mean, you know, ar- and arguably Porter has the best resume of opponents that he's that in the whole welterweight division to this point if he went in there and blew out sean porter you, he, nobody can blow out sean porter you exactly. just can't you no just exactly can't. if he goes in there and beats him over 12 rounds convincingly or ko's him or tko's him I, I, that would put a mark of stamp of approval from the shepmeister here <laughs> you know i i would take that shepherd <laughs> shepherd <laughs> <laughs> no you're right you're right you should do the whole show like that. <laughs> whole show like that. <laughs> Just repeat everything. <laughs> but I mean, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, I think Top Rank needs to needs to needs to figure out what they're gonna put for him because he needs a name. He needs a name, and it's gonna be interesting. But man. I think I, I I was disappointed that he he's like, oh yeah, I don't I don't need them. I think he's just frustrated. He was like, oh yeah, I don't need them. Like even though like 
in previous yeah. interviews, he was saying that he like, oh yeah, there's no such thing as wrong side of the street. They can come see me or something. Like, I think he's just to the point where he's just like, forget it. Like, hey, I don't need them. Like, pretty much, I'm trying to like egg them on. Maybe like a reverse psychology thing, you know? I don't know, but like, I don't see who else he could get anymore. There's nobody else there. No, no, there's not. Not a legitimate opponent. No. He's probably going to rematch Jeff Horn or something. <laughs> you know, the 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 rematch of the century or something like that. You never know. You never know. But you know, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. And then uh, a co-main event, which was a fight where mostly everybody was looking forward to, and you know, in in terms of this card, Teofimo Lopez knocks out Richard Comey in the second round and gains his first world title, the IBF lightweight world title. Uh, Teofimo Lopez gets the 15th win of his career. And it's kind of kind of going back to Virgil Ortiz. Virgil Ortiz just got the 15th win of his career. Um, you know, these these kids are both kind of like at... I mean, Teofimo Lopez obviously a little bit ahead because he's got the world title. But, hey, a lot of people were saying don't count out Comey. And I, I agree with that. I think we talked about it before. And I was like, yeah, don't count him out. Like, he's world champ and stuff like that. But, you know, like, and maybe it's just me, but, like, Comey's from... Like, Nigeria? Uh, Ghana, I believe. Ghana? I, I always thought about when Crawford fought in Dongo for the undisputed world cha- titles at 140. And then people thought, oh, yeah, one, they both got each uh, two belts. It's going to be a good fight. And then Crawford blew him out. F- may, I don't know, maybe because they're both from Ghana. I kind of had that same feeling going into this fight, especially as it was about to start. Um, And Lopez, I mean, in that knockout punch, I think he got him with like an overhand left. They both went in for right hands. He, I believe, he and, just he, he just, just beat him to quicker. he beat him to the punch. Yeah, you know, like would it would it have been would it have been a different outcome if Comey would have beat him to the punch? We'll we'll never right. No, you're right. But like, what if like Comey's was in the same area like and Comey beat him to the punch? I mean, we'll never know. But We've never really seen Lopez have a chin check. That's true. Yet, but he did look good though. Like up until that point, he. he it was knocked him out. I mean, he made a statement. Yeah, it looked good. Obviously, you know, Lopez can kind of obviously proved everybody wrong. You know, people were worrying about what it was the family could, drama, like you mentioned last week. Yeah, the family drama. You know, he struggled to make weight. Top rank had paid for a nutritionist for him yeah. for this camp. He weighed in, looked good, looked healthy, looked quick, said he had a good camp. The only problem I see is when they kind of went into the ring afterwards and they were talking to him about, is he going to fight Teofimo Lopez? He never really. St- no, oh, Loma? Is, is he going to fight Lomachenko? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he never really goes out there and says anything. He's just like, oh, you know who I want next. And there was nothing honestly, like kind of like honestly, clarifying and I, legitifying you, you, that fight coming but up. But you know what, though? That doesn't bother me because like Loma's at that point the last couple years or at least maybe the last year or two where like he knows that he's a badass fighter. He knows it. He knows that he's freaking good. And he kind of has that swagger behind it. Like when they had asked him before, like, Hey, you know, Teofimo Lopez in the future, you know, he's going to fight Comey and then they want to face the winner, but everybody says it's going to be Lopez. And Lomachenko was like, who is he? You know, get, you know, I don't, I don't care about him. He's just a kid. He's like, get him a world title and then maybe we could talk. So he's pretty much kind of like downplaying him. But like how he said that in, in those interviews, like Loma knows that he's a badass fighter, that he's one of the best in the world, if not the best in the world. And he has that swagger. He's like, yeah. I honestly think Loma wipes the floor with him. Do you think it happens though? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to say. I is- don't think it happens next. I don't. I think Top Rank is going to try to milk Lopez's is 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 world title reign. I think they're at least going to give him one voluntary, and then Loma another, you know, fight in between, and then they'll match him up. They'll probably put him on the same card. I, I co-main and main because of Tifomo Lopez never really kind of clarifying and you know calling him out and being like, hey, you're next, you know, when they're both in the stadium together. I wonder whether... Because it's T- not next. It's not next. Yeah, but then I think the th- what I'm trying to get to is I think that Teofimo Lopez might play on the fact that he's struggling to make weight. Just be like, hey, I'm 22, 23 years old. I'm going to step up, protect that O. He's got a title now at that, that weight division. Move up to the next one. Two-weight world champion. true. Three weight world champion, the Teofimo Lopez. That's true. Lomachenko fight that's never true. happens because before this, his last fight, before this one, his dad and then even him in interviews has said that he was already having trouble making one thirty five and doesn't know whether he'll be able to finish the year at that weight category. Yeah, that's true. That's I'm, where I, I'm I, forgot, leading to. I forgot about that. That's true. I can see that because I think we yeah, we we had talked about this last week too for for a little bit. I don't know if it was on the show or it was off air, but 
if he was able to beat Comey, which he did, he's a world champion at 135. If he vacates and goes to 140, he automatically becomes like a number one contender for a world title at 140, essentially, because he's coming up as a world champion from the division below. And like you said, two weight world champ in the span of six months. He's still undefeated. Ah, I can, and they know that Lomachenko is not going to move up from 135. That's his ceiling. Yeah, he's too. He's too. You know what? I could totally see that, but they're going to get so much backlash. At least top rank and all these other guys. Like, well, oh, what they, the they'll blame it on his buddy. They'll say like, hey, you know, it wasn't safe to fight at 135 yeah. anymore. I, you know what? That's very realistic. I could see that totally <laughs> happening. You heard I'm it here a, first. I could see that totally happen. Yeah, they're going to be like, hey, you know, he's. They might get. They might see if he can make. If he can make one voluntary defense. Just, just the interviews and the stuff coming out from the family made me think for a long time. Uh, Jose Ramirez, Jose Ramirez, Teofimo Lopez at 140? Yeah, I'm all in for that. I'm all in for the Lop- the Lomachenko fight if it happens. I just don't... I, the way yeah. that they're talking and reading between the lines, I, I can see it not happening. Or does Ramirez move up to 147? Teofimo Lopez goes up and they top rank finagles the way for him to get a world title shot for those two belts or one belt or something like that? You could see it. I could see it. You could see it. I could totally see it. I mean, that's what they did with uh, Horn and Crawford. Crawford became undisputed. They got the belt on Horn because Pacquiao's contract with top rank was already ending. They got the belt on Horn. They gave Horn a voluntary defense. Crawford moves up, takes care of Horn, takes the belt. I could totally see that. But Lopez did. I th- I thought he d- he he needed what he needed to do. Like. I didn't. I didn't want to see a decision. I was like, "Nah, he needs to knock the guy out." You yeah, know, he's kind of you know, like he was talking about the similar track to Virgil Ortiz, but he's you know, he's a promoter's dream. He looks good. He gets in there. He blows people out. Does talks, the backflips. He does the backflips. He's there putting on the Heisman Trophy winner's uh, shirt afterwards. All that sort of stuff. You know, that's the difference between them. You know, he's co-maining, headlining events where Virgil Ortiz just because he doesn't have that. You know, that star power yet. Right. No, you're right. You're right. Um, and then quickly also on that card, uh, Michael Conlon improves at 13-0, and he avenges his Olympic loss, right, um, in a unanimous decision win over Vladimir, Vladimir Nikitin um, by scores of 98, 92, 99, 91, and 190. And then if people remember when he lost, it was a gold medal final, wasn't it? Or it was one of the – Finals, semifinals. It was you know deep into the Olympic Olympic Games or Olympic trials. Um, Conlon was like infamous for flipping off the judges and all that stuff. So, um, but this is the guy who beat him. You know, um, I think they said that he had beat him twice. He beat him career, twice. Yeah, right? in the amateurs, he beat him twice. Yeah, yeah obviously he as a pro, Michael Conlon, you know, rectifies that. Redemption, as all the t-shirts Redemption. and stuff were called. With the middle finger at yeah. the end. I thought that was kind of interesting. But Michael Conlon, he's a hard watch. I think Top Rank are doing the right thing. You know, keep putting him out in on the East Coast in front yeah. of the Irish fans. But I think they're going to put him out again in March, right, for like... Uh, Paddy's Day. St. Paddy's Day, yeah. But he's, he's hard to watch. He's not exactly fan-friendly. Yeah, he's not. But, you know, hey, it, it, if they can get something out of it, it's going to work out. Uh, and then moving on, uh, this upcoming Friday, the 20th of December from... And not a not a usual not a usual boxing venue uh, here in the boxing circles, but from the talking what is it? Am I saying this right? Talking Stick Resort Arena. What does that mean? Talking Stick. I'm from England. I don't know. Oh my gosh! Stop. Talking Stick Resort Arena in Phoenix, Arizona, on the zone. Uh, Daniel Jacobs comes back to the ring since his loss to Canelo Alvarez back in May, and goes up against the legend, the son of the legend. Excuse me, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. I mean, everybody's disappointed in Chavez, you know, like, even though, like, he has a name behind him and stuff, but, like, I'm really hoping just because on Chavez is, like, he's, he's, he obviously looks good in training camp, he looks like he's training hard, I'm really hoping this is a great fight. I'm really hoping it is. They're fine at 168. I'll, be, I'll believe it. I'm hoping it is. When David Diamante is in the ring and he says, Chavez. It's, it's going to be Buffer. Chavez. It's not going to be Diamante. It's going to be Buffer. Well, I'm not going to the fight then. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's going to be Buffer. Buffer always does the main events. Because I, I believe it when Chavez steps through those ropes. He's got to get past the weigh-in. Vada could get him Friday night. You know what? That Haven't we been talking about that for a couple weeks now? Mm-hmm. Especially ever since that the whole... You know the Vada coming to test him, and he didn't want to test. And he his his reasoning was like, I hadn't even signed a contract yet. Where you kind of come test me and stuff. Like that. 
and he had a hearing I think last week at with the Nevada State Athletic, Com- Athletic Commission. So it's still kind of up in the air. That, Which is why the fight's in Arizona. Yeah, it's still, that's why they moved it from Nevada to Arizona. So it's still kind of up in the air that Chavez might not even fight on Friday, even though as of right now, he's supposed to fight. So if you're listening to this, as of right now, Monday, he's supposed to fight. But guess what? Gabe Rosado's on that card to be that standby. I mean, he knows he's a standby. He's like, if he doesn't, they're going to throw him in there with Jacobs. I would love to see that fight, though. No, Jacobs you, and Gabe Rosado? I mean, like, I, I, th- I think it would produce fireworks. I think it would produce fireworks, but, like, I think, I think, I think the hype that you have for it is way too much. This Rosado th- is always in the wall. It, he is, but he's not, it's, he's not the same as he was a couple of years ago. No, no. I think Jacobs blows him out. <laughs> it's interesting not just to see Jacobs at 168. Oh, I think he's going to look fine. I think he'll look good. I mean, he's already a big guy anyway. Yeah. He, can be, he can fight at 175, technically. He could. I think it'd be good just because he's like six. What is he? Six foot, six foot and a half. Yeah, he's tall, and then you know, just not having to boil down to that to the to one sixty. So I think he'd look good. He'd look fresh at one sixty eight. Change of trainer as well be interesting. Um, you know, with his split from Andre Rizier. Oh, he did split, huh? So yeah. who's he being trained by right now? Is he still training in New York? I mean, he lives in Brooklyn. The name, the name's gone. I can't think who it is. But is he's, anybody notable? He split from Andre Rizier due to. Uh, I think it was the same as Triple G, some money issues. See, it always those, comes down to money those issues. Those big purses. Tyson Fury just split from Ben Davison. And what did I tell you right before we came on here? Is that is that I, I'm kind of leaning towards it's a money issue. You know, Davison's been training with Fury a couple times now where his, you know, his stock's going up. And Fury's about to probably get arguably the biggest payday of his career with the Wilder rematch on Fox and ESPN pay-per-view. And then he leaves and he goes to uh, Manny Stewart's nephew who doesn't really have the name recognition, but he's going to have a lower price tag. Well, that's it. Well, you tell, know, tell the, me I'm wrong. The usual 10% of tell me 10, I'm wrong. 10 grand isn't too much, but when you're paying 10% of, was it a $100 million contract with ESPN? Tell me I'm wrong. You're giving Ben Davidson 10 million? Tell me I'm wrong. We'll see. I, I see it. That's happening now. Triple G, Fury. I, I think that's why Fury left. I think so. I mean, this, we're just speculating, but... Um, I totally forgot Jacobs left Rozier. I totally forgot that. But you don't you don't remember who he's being trained by? I think it's a, is it um Salas? I don't, I don't know. Salas? I, I don't know. I don't know who I just remember I just remember when you mentioned that, that he's not that he left them, so I mean Oh they are? Oh Wildcard, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Rosado's trained at Wildcard too. He's been trained at Wildcard right there, him and Chavez, so they're probably <coughs> right there. That's crazy. That is crazy. But, you know, I think, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. But you don't think that the boxing world would get a lot more attention if Chavez Jr. somehow wins this fight, especially if he actually wins with an like an emphatic statement? You don't think that in terms of, like, popularity? What if Chavez Jr. comes back and, like, he, like, wins? For example, he knocks him out. Imagine that. Well, you know how crazy that would be? That, that, that's a good story, but I, I don't see that happening. I think Chavez is just one of those fighters that people keep, they, they kind of roll him out. He has a good fan base. Because of his dad. S- people still believe in him and still think, you know, he's got one more fight in him. He's got one more fight in him. I think, you know, same as anything, you know, he's not getting any younger. He's, what, 55 fights into his career, all the drinking, all the drugs, all the partying. You know, he was supposed to fight earlier this year. His dad pulled him out at the last minute. You know, he's not really had any warm-up fights. He's coming in and fighting Daniel Jacobs. Well, he did He did have that one fight earlier, but it was just kind of, it was like, like in Mexico a, or something. Nobody right? in Mexico, yeah. So, I mean, and that was his first fight since Canelo in 2017. I mean, technically, he's only here headlining the event because of his name due to his due to his. Yeah, well, I mean, we talked, we, like we mentioned before we came on air again, that I'm guaranteeing most of the fans who are going to be there that night are going to be Chavez fans. They're going to be Hispanics, yeah. you know? So, but I think it, it's an intriguing fight. So, I mean, I don't know. But uh, moving on to this Saturday, the 21st of December from the Copper Box Arena in London, England, your motherland, Mike, on ESPN Plus, the plus uh, heavyweight prospect. Daniel Dubois goes up against, all right, you're saying this name. You got this. Kyoto Fujimoto. Fujimoto. For the WBC Silver and WBO International Heavyweight title. So uh, Dynamite Dubois is promoted by Queensberry Promotions, right? Uh, Frank Warren. Frank Warren, yep. And um, there's a lot of hype behind him. 
you know, Frank future Warren, heavyweight world title. As they keep saying, you know, I think Frank Warren looks at him as like how Eddie Hearn has was looking at Anthony Joshua back in the day. So he's hoping they're ka-ching, kind of, ka-ching, ka-ching, yeah, just the money sign. Yeah. So I mean, hey, you know, you never know. You never know. He's thirteen and zero with twelve KOs right now. So do you think his he has a high ceiling? I, I believe he has a high ceiling. Uh, he's slowly getting better. They're moving him well, moving him slow. You know, he's only 22 years old, and in heavyweight terms, that's a baby. Yeah. Being 22. That's a, that's a child, yeah. So, you know, he, by the time he gets to, you know, 26, 27, 28, I would imagine your Anthony Joshua's, your Deontay Wilder's, they'll have gone. So, you know, he's in a great position at the moment to take it slow, just get the experience, get the rounds, and eventually take over that division unless someone comes out of the blue. Right. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see, but Dynamite Dubois. So I'm glad they changed his nickname to Dynamite because I think he used to call him Triple D. Well, that's because of Dynamite Daniel. Is that Dynamite why? Dynamite Dubois, I, Triple D. Wait, but they don't, do they still say Triple D or do they just yeah. say Dynamite? No, no, both. both. Really? I, th- I think they should, tro- they should drop the Triple D and just call him Dynamite. You, just, you, can, you can call him that. Though. I think it's too much. I'm just saying. I'm, th- I'm thinking about like an image Triple wise. D, Triple G. Triple H. Come on. That's true, yeah. Come on. It's just too much. He's got two nicknames, Triple D, Trip I don't know. Dynamite, just leave it. I don't know. <laughs> he just, I like Dynamite. I, I I would stick with that, but um that should be, you know, he's obviously still on the on the prospect path. They're just trying to get him some wins under his belt, make him look good, build his profile. Um, and then I would say by his what, maybe eighteenth, nineteenth fight, he tries to get like a prominent name. I think they'll move him really slow. I think they'll wait for the bigger guys to kind of fade away. Wait till you know they're on the the tail end of their career, then Dubois can use them as a resume mover. Like a Pavekin or something like that? Yeah, yeah, you know, Pavekin's getting old, didn't look great against Michael Hunter, who's technically a cruiserweight. Yeah. So I could see someone like Pavekin, you know, being cannon fodder down the line. Yeah, I could totally see that, yeah. Sacrificial lamb. There we go. Yeah. Uh, and also this Saturday from the Toyota Arena here in Ontario, California, on Fox. This is a Fox Sports 1? I thought it was Fox. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was Regular Fox, I guess not. On Fox Sports One, uh, the rematch and one from one of the one of the upsets of last year, would you say? Um, Tony Harrison, the WBC Super Welterweight World Champion, uh, defends his recently won title that he won last year against Jermel Charlo in the rematch. I mean, there's bad blood here. I really think these guys hate each other. No, they do. Obviously, Charlo's upset that Harrison beat him in the first match. And then obviously the rematch was called off due to Tony Harrison supposedly suffered torn ligaments. And I say supposedly because Charlo says that Tony Harrison has admitted that he postponed it on purpose. But as far as I know, you have to give a doctor's notice. and Well, suppose You can't I mean, just turn around and tell the promoter, yeah, I'm injured. You know, I'm pretty sure that has to be all legitimized through doctors, scans, x-rays and stuff like that. So, you know, the, uh, the face-to-face that Fox did was pretty animated. HBO face off? Did you know did the face off? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it was um it should be a good fight. You know, Tony Harrison seems to, in my opinion, got into Charlo's head. Charlo He did. You could you could totally see that Charlo the Charlo brothers, especially uh Jer- Jermel, like you could totally see that it they they're they're ve- they're very easily irritated. Well and Tony Harrison seems to be quite quick. You know, he's a bit of a wordsmith. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's good at the banter. And I think, you know, he just kind of like has Charlo running around in circles because yeah. he'll say something, but Tony Harrison will well, kind of twist and turn and get out of it and kind of make Charlo look silly. And Charlo doesn't have that in his arsenal to be able to come back at him. And I think that really, really winds him up. If Charlo, if Charlo wins, do they fight three times, trilogy? If Charlo wins, yeah, I could see that. But I see it. I, I could see that he'd probably have to, yeah, since he's... You know, if Charlo could get out of it, I don't think he'd I think want to do it again. I think he's going to try to get out of it if, yeah. if, if he wins, or he's going to try to push it as far as he can. But I think Harrison's going to have a claim like, no, you're going to give me a, a trilogy. So I, can, I, think, I, on, I honestly think Charlo knocks him out this time. I think Harrison beats him. Really? Oh, I think so. Shit, I we're, think, I think we're Char- opposite this week. I think Charlo has ca- kind of slightly been protected. He didn't look good against, was it uh, John Jackson when oh, he, when he fought him? Even Vanas Matrosian. That's right. I totally forgot great, about that. Didn't look great against him. I think he's been protected. He's been fed people to look very, very good against. And then when he goes in there and his are athletic you, ability and power isn't enough. Are you saying his brother Jamal's better? I, I, I would think so. And I think Harrison's just his boxing IQ. He's clever. 
he's wound him up to the point where it's going to be maybe oh, yeah. like a Jose Aldo, Conor McGregor, where whoa, Charles whoa, whoa, just going to come whoa. out the blocks, whoa, 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 run whoa. at him, try and knock him out, and you know Harrison just you know sidesteps, boom. No, Harrison does have really good boxing technique. That's how he beat he him the first time. Yep. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's the biggest thing. Like you, like you mentioned, like how Luis just mentioned too, is that he's in Charlo's head. Because like even at the press conferences they had in LA and 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 all their stuff, like you could just see it in Charlo's face. He's just like, I hate this guy. Like you, yeah. he, he's bothered. He's bothered. And I knew it too after after the first fight when Harrison's name got announced. Harrison was trying to take the high road and try to. And he, at first he said when he was interviewed, he's like, you know, he. Charlo gave me gave me the opportunity. He's like, let's run it back. I'm gonna give. You. He was trying to be respectful, and Charlo got got irritated. He was like, no, nah, no, nah, I won that fight. And you can see Harrison just switch. He's like, what? No, you did it. And after that, they just. I think Harrison knew he was trying to be the the nice guy. He was like, yeah, you know, let's run it back. You gave me an opportunity, and and then Charlo and then Charlo just kept throwing back at him. And then Harrison's like, oh, forget it. Then I'm not gonna be nice to you. I think it. I think it makes for a more entertaining matchup, though. Like they really do hate each other. I honestly believe that. I know people like they do this for marketing purposes and stuff, but I really do believe they hate each other. Like absolutely. So um, that's going to be an exciting fight. So you're go. You you got Harrison. I got Charlo. So we'll see what happens this Saturday. What did, what did they always say about you know rematches tend to go the same way? Not all the time. Oh, Joshua Ruiz. I knew you were going to say that. Whoa, 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 whoa. They, they tend to go the same they way. They tend to go the same way. Yeah, maybe. Marquez Pacquiao. Anybody? They went four times. Yeah, that's true. Depends. Mor- yeah, Morales, Morales Barrera. Morales Think about it. Mor- yeah, Morales Pacquiao. Come on, Mike. <laughs> I'm just going to throw facts at you. We'll see. We'll uh, see this week. Also on that card, a middleweight fight. Hugo Centeno Jr. Uh, goes up against Juan Macias Montiel. Uh, Centeno fought Charlo, Jamal Charlo, the, the middleweight brother. Um, it was actually, unfortunately stopped, but, um, and then I think Centeno got like a win after that. And then he, I think he lost his last fight against, who did he fight? William uh, Monroe Jr. William Monroe Jr. In June. Um, so, um, I think he's the betting odds, betting odds favorite for this one. Um, so, I mean, who do you think gets this one? I mean, they got similar records. I think Hugo uh, Santana should win this. He's won three out of his last four, heading into the Monroe fight. Uh, I think it's you know picked picked for him to get back onto the winning streak, and then obviously moving back up through the division. You know he's still young, been in there with some good guys. He's got the good experience, so now he's just kind of switch his head on and you know coming towards the end of his career. Really, still young, but yeah. But I, th- I th- I'm picking him to win this fight. I think he's got it. I think he's got it. And, you know, fighting in Southern California. We've got to back the California boys. His, his fans are coming out. He's from uh, the Ventura County, Oxnard area. So we'll see how it, it comes about. But, um, you know, wrapping up here, um, you know, we want to again say to go listen to the previous episode that you did. You were at the Fantasy Springs Casino interviewed Mikey Garcia, um, which I'm so pissed off about because I wasn't there. I remember I got a text. I got a text like an hour before, and he was like, I got Mikey. I was like, you liar. He's like, no. He's like, I asked him right now. He's like, I asked him right now. And he said, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm going to go to the back because he was going to walk out with Virgil or something like that. He's like, but I'll be back out. And the whole night, Mike was like, man, I hope he doesn't forget. I hope he doesn't forget. <laughs> but he got him. He got him. So we appreciate that. Um, and then Cynthia Conte was also nice enough to jump on there. So we uh, give our thanks to her for, for helping us out too. Um, anything interesting? From that interview, I mean, obviously people can listen to it, but yeah, I would say listen to it. Obviously, you know, we talk about Virgil Ortiz. We go into, you know, who he wants to fight next. Ask him about the Jesse Vargas interview. Talk about Manny Pacquiao. Also, talk about his opinion on, you know, he those... called out Pacquiao too on on the episode. He pretty yeah. much he pretty much said like, I want the Pacquiao fight. Yeah, he did. He said he wants Pacquiao next. So you know, listen to see what he says about that. The WBC franchise belts. His opinion on fighting at catch weights. You know, quite a lot of things. You know, talks about what he does outside of the ring as well. You know, it's a 20 to 25 minute interview, so it's not going to take up all afternoon to listen to it, but it's a good listen. Yeah. So go back and uh, listen to it. If you haven't listened to it, that's a good show. Um, it's Mike Cynthia Conte from uh, The Ring, Ring TV, Ring Magazine, and uh, four weight world champion, Mikey Garcia, even though Mike calls him a three weight world champion at the I, beginning. I took one off him, yeah. Yeah, he messed up. And you knew it right after, too, after you finished the interview. Well, I'm a like, fan oh, of his. I messed up. I'm a fan of his, but I was like, Obviously, got him on, and then I was kind of thinking, right, well, it's a three-weight world champion. Yeah. I kept thinking, like, 
He's not far away because he lost to Errol Spence. And then <laughs> as soon as I announced him, I was like, that doesn't sound right. Yeah. But you kept going. It's all right. Yeah. It's all right. So but once again, guys, we appreciate you listening to episode 62. No, 61. Sorry. 61 of the Last Round Podcast. Uh, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Audio Boom, Radio Republic. I don't know. All those, all those other apps. There's a lot of them. We're on a bunch of them. And some of them I don't even, I've never even seen. But we're on there. There's some type of audience on there. Um, but go ahead, Mike, tell people where they can follow us on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, at the last round 12 And be sure to tune in next week. We'll give you the lowdown on Jacobs Chavez and Tony Harrison Charlo, Centeno, and Montiel. Awesome. So I'm Danny Z from my co-host, Michael Shepard. Shepard, this is the last round. Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.